All right, we're gonna go ahead and finish up 2.2 here. Uh, it is clear from the limit laws that to evaluate the limit of a polynomial function p of x as x approaches c, you only need to evaluate p, that's p, of c. So p at that point c. To evaluate the limit of a rational function r of x as x approaches c, at which the denominator is not zero, in other words, we don't have a hole in the graph, or a asymptotes and stuff like that, you simply need to evaluate P of C. Again, so and as long as we're not having any kind of issues with it not being existent at that point, we can pretty much do that if it's uh, polynomials, because polynomials are all nice and smooth and continuous, we're not gonna have crazy holes and stuff in them. Uh, if it's rational, then as long as we're not dividing by zero at that point, then we can go ahead and plug it in. So theorem two, limits of polynomials, the limit of the polynomial is just plugging in where you're taking the limit at for each point there, for each term. Limits of rational functions, assuming the denominator does not equal zero at the point, is just plugging in C at those points. Okay? Uh, identifying common factors. It can be shown that if Q of X is a polynomial and Q of C equals zero, then X minus C is a factor of Q of X. Thus, if the numerator and denominator of a rational function of a rational function of x are both zero at x equals c, they have x minus c as a common factor. So if it's a common factor, we can start to eliminate the zeros in the denominator. So let's take a look at this one. Here, if we try plugging in one, we get one, one squared, which is one, plus one minus two over. 1 squared, which is 1, minus 1. And what we end up with here is 0 divided by 0. Right? And we can't have that. We can't divide by 0. So what we can do is actually make this the limit as x goes to 1. And we can go ahead and factor this. This is going to be x plus 2 times x uh, minus 1 divided by x times x minus 1. And see that x minus 1 is a nice factor for both of them, since they both went to zero at x equals one, which means we can do that, which means we get the limit as x goes to one of x plus two over x, which we can actually go ahead and plug in numbers for that. That's just going to be one plus two over one, which is just one third, okay? So there you go for that one. That is, um, I'm sorry, that's not one-third, it's three. I flipped that around. That's three over one, which is just three. Sorry, there you go. Okay, so we can take a look at that. Uh, even though we have a hole in the graph there, the hole is right here, we can shift over to this other function and see what it's doing at that point, just because we can actually cancel out uh, that hole because it's not an asymptote or anything. We can cancel it out and be done with that. So note the graph of f of x equals x squared plus x minus 2 over x squared minus x. is this, It's the same as the other graph, except at x equals 1. Except at x equals 1. The functions have the same limit. All right, the same limit. That was not very well written. I'm just going to write the word limit as x goes to 1. And so since they have the same limit, we can just take the limit of the second one and be done. So for this one... I think um, I'll do this one for you, and then I'm going to leave the next page for you to try. So the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared plus 100 minus 10 over x squared. Again, if you try plugging this in, it's not going to work. You're going to get a 0 in the denominator, and you're also going to get that in the, top, in the numerator. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to multiply this by the conjugate of the numerator. So x squared plus 100 plus 10 over the square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10. And so if I multiply it by this conjugate, what's going to happen is I'm going to get the limit as x goes to 0 of, now multiply these together, do your foiling, you're going to get x squared plus 100, right? And then minus a 100, like that. And then... In the denominator, you have x squared times the square root of x squared plus 100 
uh, plus 10, just like that. And uh, looking at this, we have a plus 100 and a minus 100 in the numerator, so those are going to cancel. We also then have x squared over x squared, so these x squareds are going to be able to cancel, and we'll be left with the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10, like that, and then now we can actually go ahead and just plug it in. This will be 1 over 0 plus 100 square rooted plus 10. So we end up with the square root of 100 and 10 plus 10. So that's this is just square root of 100, which is 10, and 10 plus 10 is 20. And so 1 20th then is your answer. And over here you can see in the table, as you get closer and closer to 0, smaller and smaller numbers from positive and negatives, you end up getting very, very close to this, okay? So anyway, doesn't quite approach for you, but 1 20th. So you have to be careful. Uh, here's a couple of them I'd like you to try. Uh, again, I'll put the answers in the notes for you. And in fact, I'm even going to add a third one. Try this as well. The limit as x goes to 1 of x minus 1 over the square root of x plus 3 minus 2. So try these three. Uh, notice the one I just wrote is very similar to the one we did on the last page, so kind of keep that in mind. And, and so is B. So try these, see if you can figure them out, and I'll write the solutions to these in the notes for you to take a look at. Um, oh, in fact, actually, I wrote that down, but it's right there on the next page, so you can just do it on the next page if you want. All right, let's take a look uh, at the sandwich theorem. So the idea here is that if you have a function that is between two other functions everywhere, right? So this blue function, look at the picture. The blue function is always less than the red function, okay? So here's our red function. Here's our red function. And the yellow function is right here. And the blue function, that wasn't a very good trace of the yellow function, and the blue function is always everywhere right between them. And then you have the red function and the yellow function. They come close together to where they have the same limit at a point. So here in the middle, they have the same limit. The red function and the, and the yellow function, they have the same limit at that point. So what we're saying is the limit of the red function right? Oh, it's actually labeled H, so I'll just put H. Maybe I'll do it in red here. So the limit of H as X goes to C is equal to the limit as X goes to C of G, which is the yellow one. Kind of hard to see there in yellow, but there you go. The limit of G. They are equal. And if that's true, and the blue one has to be greater than the yellow one and less than the red one everywhere, then it also has to have that same limit. Then this must also then equal the limit as x goes to c for the blue one, which I need a blue. Blue is f. Then they all three must be equal. And so if you know the limit of h and g, then you can basically get the limit of f, even if f is crazy oscillating all over the place and you couldn't do its limit otherwise. So even if you have something, it's going crazy, you can't take the limit on its own, it's bouncing all around, but you know that it's sandwiched between two other ones, then you know it has to go to that limit as well, which is stated down here in the theorem. Suppose that g of x uh, is everywhere less than f of x, which is everywhere less than h of x for all x and some open interval containing c, except possibly at c itself. Suppose that these two limits of g of x and h of x, that's the red function and the yellow function, are equal then the limit of the blue function, the one between them, f of x, is also equal to L. All right, pretty simple idea. Just make sure you get it and you use it. So let's take a look here. Given that uh, 1 minus x squared over 4 is everywhere less than u of x, which is everywhere less than 1 plus x squared over 2 for all x not equal to 0, find the limit of u of x, whatever u of x. We don't even have to actually know what u of x is. So we can just take a look at the limit for the red function. So the limit for the red function, which is uh, 
which is 1 plus x squared over 2 as x goes to 0, all right? That's just going to equal 1 plus 0 squared over 2, which is just going to be 1. And the limit as x goes to 0 for the yellow function, 1 minus x squared over 4, that's a squared, is just going to be 1 minus 0 squared over 4, which is just 1. So they both have the same limit there. And so therefore, the limit as x goes to 0 of u of x, whatever function it happens to be, assuming it's always between those two, is also equal to 1. Okay? It doesn't really matter what's happening there as long as we have... So let's say hey, we've got the yellow function doing something like this. We've got class here in just a few minutes. We've got the red function doing this. And then the blue function, it can do whatever in the world it wants to do. As long as it always stays between those two, then it's going to have that same limit. All right, I'm going to leave this next one for you to try as well. So take a look at doing it. And uh, same thing for this one. Uh, take a look at this one, see what you can do, and again, I'll fill that out in the notes, and then that'll be pretty much it. So uh, that's it for this section. Thanks a lot.